This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this interview, I talk with the writer Lou Aronica. We talk about the evolving book business, moving beyond writing as a living, the job of a co-writer, his work collaborating with Sir Ken Robinson, and organizing your book idea. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have Lou Aronica. Lou Aronica has 35 years of high-level experience in the book business. He was publisher of two of the industry's largest imprints, Avon Books and Berkeley Books, and deputy publisher of a third, Bantam Books. As a writer, he is the author of 24 books, including the New York Times nonfiction bestsellers The Element and Finding Your Element with Sir Ken Robinson. In addition to this, he has authored nonfiction national bestsellers The Culture Code, the USA Today bestselling novel The Forever Year, and the national bestselling novel Blue. Lou is also former president of Novelist Inc. and is the president and publisher of the Story Plant and Fiction Studio books that we'll talk a little bit about in this episode. It's my delight to have him today on the show. Welcome, Lou. Thank you very much. So share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Oh, wow. <laughs> Do you have that much time? <laughs> uh, it's, you know, I think the, you know, the, the fascinating, the, the biggest challenge in, in every day is just trying to, to keep up with how, um, how the book business is evolving because mm-hmm. it's, it's changing um, at an almost granular level and it's changing so quickly um, that, it's impossible to have any underpinnings at, at, at this point, uh, you know. And, and I've been in the business for a very long time, as you as you pointed out. But this is the first time where I feel as though uh, it's unrealistic to to come into any day with a clear plan. You know, you just have to sort of go where uh, where things take you, um, and that's especially true in terms of bringing books to the public because of how um, of how much that has has changed in the last few years. Now, your life could have gone on a very different path. I believe it was, and early on you were thought you were thinking about becoming a, a school teacher. Um, I was. Yes. So, so uh, can can you imagine if you'd gone into that life? Do you think you'd have been as fulfilled as, as in the work that you do today? You know, it's funny because I, I I doubt it because I love what I do and and as challenging as it is, I. I I love the challenge. However, I do find myself saying on a, on a regular basis, boy, it'd be really nice to be a college professor right now. You know, it'd be, you know, I, I would love to do that. Maybe, maybe in my next career, you know, just, you know, teaching a bunch of, of, you know, brilliant writing students, that would be really, really fun. Um, so I, you know, I think, I, I think I would have enjoyed being a teacher. I, I do love teaching and I love the field of education. And in fact, I've written um, a book with Ken Robinson about education and we're working on a second right now. Um, but it's hard to imagine that I would have uh, been as engaged on a daily basis, especially 30 something years in uh, with teaching as, as I am with, uh, with books and writing. And now, you know, today you're obviously a New York Times bestseller many times. Was that, was that an early goal for you as a writer? Did, was that, that the thing you wanted to do? Or was it really just, I just want to just, just make a living from, from writing and let's see where, where it takes me? Or do, do you have any kind of clear goals in mind? The, certainly the original goal back, you know, back when I was just getting out of college was to make a living as a writer. That was you know, something that I, I really wanted. And, and in fact, I, I got into book when I couldn't get a job teaching, I got it, I got into book publishing, um, because I thought that would be a good way to sort of learn that side of the business so that I would have a, a more effective approach to, uh, you know, to, to working as, as a writer. Um, but then once I, um, you know, once I sort of fell in love with the book business, um, it became, less of a goal to make a living as a writer and more of a goal simply to um, to express myself as a writer. Um, that it turned out that I can now make a living as a writer is kind of a happy byproduct. So was it difficult though? I mean, you were starting, first of all, you were kind of getting involved in the, the business side and the publishing side. Um, I would imagine it'd be quite easy just to get so involved just purely doing that 
and let, let the writing <laughs> sit <laughs> sit on a on a shelf for a while. So, what made you you know get up earlier doing writing, writing late, you know weekends? What gave you that hunger to still pursue being a writer in your own right? Well, to be honest, it, I, I didn't, nothing did. Um, what happened was it, it was it was purely accidental. Um, I think it was it was there underneath all the time, and I, I remember um, saying to to my wife uh, for a couple of years before it, it started that you know I really you know I had a novel that I really wanted to write. I really wanted to write it, and and you know and, and you know I was I was already getting up at you know quarter to six in the morning just to go commute into into new york city and you know by the time i got home at night i was i was toast and i did want to spend a little time with my family so so the you know carving out more time to be a writer was was hardly an option um and but what happened was that the uh, avon books was was acquired by um news corp and uh and they didn't need executive management no matter how successful executive management had uh, had made the company so i i found myself in in a position where i could suddenly uh have the time um uh, without being worried about about the money and um and what i decided to do rather than write was to develop stories for for other people to write hmm. and i started working on a novel for somebody else to write and wound up selling it based on a treatment to a publisher at which point it was time to turn it over to another writer at which point I realized I couldn't do it at which point I realized I just was so attached to that story that there was no chance I was going to let somebody else write it um, and that novel became the forever year which was the first first book that I ever published and there was obviously there's people that that's kind of what they do I mean I'm thinking um the uh, the novelist uh, who just come out with all the book shorts. I think they call them book shorts. Yeah, uh, James James Patterson. Yeah. James Patterson. So that's his 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 skill is in coming up with ideas, outlining and and uh, working with a team of writers uh, right. in that way and, and ref- refining. So is, is is that a common thing in in, in the industry? And in in it's, the it's not. And and at the time, really, nobody was doing it the way I was planning to do it, which was to to really. I mean, there there were people who were doing who were sort of coming up with series ideas, the way a, a you know a, a TV showrunner might come up with a series idea or something like that. But there was there was nobody who was really coming up with individual novels that they would bring the story to and then work with a writer to turn into full fledged novels. And and I think I actually figured out why that is with this process because in order to do it really well, you have to get so deep into the story. And then if you've got any writerly genes at all, you have such a level of ownership of the story at that point that the notion of having somebody else write it is is just ludicrous. I didn't realize that that was the way it was going to turn out, but that's exactly how it turned out. So so that's uh, you know and that and that would not have happened. You know, I'm not sure I'm not sure how it would have played out otherwise, because I think if um, you know, if I had not had the opportunity to to go entrepreneurial and if i had instead of having that opportunity decided to just go after another you know executive publishing job i would probably just be doing that and and might never have actually gotten around to i would be i would still be saying today that one of these days i'm going to write a novel which is 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 a, is a classic phrase that you hear from people indeed, really. indeed. <laughs> they say, and <laughs> and um one of the things that was it was a, a relatively recent eye opener for me was talking to a friend um who very uh who has had a hit with a, a book um and in non fiction world as well and then uh, being introduced to his agent and having a discussion with the agent and finding out there was actually a ghostwriter involved Mm-hmm. And, and I didn't actually, re- you know, I mean, I'd been involved with other people with books where they ghost re- ghost re- written, but the, the book was written in such a way that I just couldn't imagine it having been written because it was very much a personal uh, story in that sense. Yeah. Um. So you you've done this interesting. You're you're not really you're not a ghostwriter, but you um are known as being a co-writer with, for example, you know, yes. uh, Ken yes. Robinson as well. Talk me through that relationship. That must be an interesting relationship when you have someone who has really incredible domain knowledge. They have an angle. They have something they want to say. What What is your your superpower? What is your un- unique ability that you're really being brought in there for? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, certainly, I, I don't think I have any superpowers. But I think the uh, the the thing that I have that 
works for me is um, is a really good sense of honesty with myself um, early on in that experience because you know I'm mean, one of the one of the nice things about these collaboration jobs is that they you know they 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 pay fairly well you know you can you can make a, a decent amount of money on somebody else's um, you know experience because you know you bring the words they bring the you know the domain knowledge as you, as you say and and um, if there's a market for that then you can sell the book for a fairly significant amount of money and share in the um, in the proceeds um, and early on in that experience for me I I worked on a book that I had no affinity for whatsoever. And and I was horrible. I mean, I was just dreadful at it. I, I couldn't I couldn't do it. I, 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 I finished the job, but it was it was bad. Was it because it and was an, on, an, on a, a domain or an area that you weren't like interested I had, in? Or? Right. I had I had no resonance with. I had no connection to. Um, I didn't really understand it well enough to really be the writer because, you know, what, what's critical for a collaborator is that the, the collaborator – be able to take what are often complex ideas from somebody who is a master at something and turn it into something that regular people like me can understand. And you can only really effectively do that, at least I can only really effectively do that if I have a real affinity for it. And, and you know, just to speak to the Ken Robinson experience, because it was exactly the opposite of that, um, when, when my agent connected me with Ken for the first time, um, we got on the phone. We were on the phone for easily an hour and a half. I was totally taken with with what he was talking about. Got off the phone, went to my wife and said, I have to work on this book. I absolutely have to work on this book. I, I need to be working with this guy. And when that happens, then really good work happens because – what you know? What I found certainly with me is I might not have the the mastery of the material, but if I have a love for the material, and I'm working with a master, then I can convey that love to other people who would have a love for that material. So, and obviously he he knows his domain. He speaks about it inc- incredibly well. Um, so when you're in there, as well as as well as the, the word crafting part, which obviously you bring in the, you know, the, that that role as well. Um, uh, is is your is part of your role to be the to be the questioner um, to be the, the the person that's kind of trying to dig in a little bit further or are you m- more trying to find um, linkages between different concepts and, and clarify certain ideas? Um, both. I mean, I think you know. In I mean, Ken is is a brilliant mind so he's uh, it, it, it's hard to use him as an example for anything because i think ken could probably do perfectly well by all by himself um as, as a writer it just take him a lot longer because he has such an active speaking career but the the goal is sort of twofold one is to is to work as an organizer to try to to pull every everything that the that the subject understands about the material into a form that can work as a book, you know, you know, bring it down to 12 chapters, bring it down to just these specifics on those, on those 12 chapters and that sort of thing. And the other is to sort of tease out the, the parts, the, the parts of it that people who aren't immersed in the world can connect with, because I think one of the, the biggest problems for a lot of, of experts is that they're experts and they don't understand what the average person doesn't understand about what they do hmm. and you know for, for, for me to sort of serve to serve as a sort of informed idiot um is kind of the the best service that i offer and that process of working with a correct i was i was reading the, the biography the other day of edward de bono um mm-hmm. who i suppose you know, people like ken robinson is of that lineage he kind of comes from there in terms of changing education the way people think about creativity and education as well um and he was very uh discounted by the academics because you know he would literally he would outline and and do a draft on a book over a weekend 
<laughs> and 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 it used to dry you know academics you just can't do that you know and um and right. so so you know obviously and one of the ways he was especially when co-writing he was doing it in terms of a series of recorded conversations with someone which would be right. then written up and then the writer would go in and kind of dig in when you're working with a with a, a co um, uh, someone you're, you're kind of co-writing a book is that is that the process is it like a series of conversations are they coming coming to you with something that's pretty fully kind of formed and written it really varies. I mean, I've had experiences where I had to write every single word of of a book with very little contribution from the the other person. Um, in fact, there was one one book that I did which wound up doing terrifically well, but but I I actually had to learn the um, the subject's business. I had to actually work with him as as I uh, you know do, doing what he was doing because he couldn't explain to me what he did. He was a genius, but he couldn't explain to me what he he did. So I had to, in that case, you know, j- just learn it all and then figure out what a book would be out of that and then organize the book and then write the book. Um, in other cases, um, it's truly like a like a collaboration where, you know, where it'll be, OK, you take this stuff and I'll take this stuff, um, because there are there are different reasons why why experts need collaborators. You know, the, the most obvious is is that they they can't write a book but but there are many who could but don't have the time to write a book or don't um don't have the patience to write a book and you know in in those cases it, what i find is there are areas where no matter what i say they're going to have to rewrite it anyway because it's analysis or it there, there's levels of of nuance there that that nobody who's not them could could bring to it and so there have been collaborations where where you know it's like okay in in chapter seven you know you do the beginning and ending i'll do all the interviews i'll do you know i'll do all the research pieces i'll you know i'll uh, you know i'll I'll do all the connective uh, material and that's the chapter and so it it ranges that much from you know from a situation where basically i'm just you, you know doing doing everything because the um the 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 expert can't uh, you know, convey the information to, you know, to, to really more a situation where it's, you know, it's two writers writing a book. It's interesting. And as you're saying that, I'm, I'm remembering to a, a kind of past life where, where I spent a lot of time working with uh, experts, in this case, it was in music and art and uh, helping them create online courses around their, mm-hmm. what they, these were Grammy award winners, people that were best at what they were, they were doing. So I was essentially kind of going in there to deconstruct what they did. And the, the people I always found hardest to work with, although it was the most kind of rewarding, were the naturally talented people. The yeah. people who could never put themselves in the shoes of a, of a someone that was reading or someone watching a bit of news and not getting it uh, because mm-hmm. most people was like you know they have to struggle trying to work out these concepts or, or technical things or something so is that similar when you're working with uh, with some of these kind of people you're writing these books with where it's quite difficult when you have people that are just so naturally gifted at what they do that they they don't know what they do so you're kind of going in there right. as, as an investigator it, it that is definitely the hardest um, it, it's it's a hard I mean you know what's kind of exciting about that is that I, I also feel in a lot of ways that that I have the most ownership of those books because I really feel as though you know all of the words are mine even if um, if it's I- explaining somebody else's you know perspective on something but but um, but it is unquestionably the toughest job and the longest job uh, the, the the thing that yeah, you know, the, the the thing that's the easiest actually to do is to work with somebody who um, who who can speak at length about something, and can speak at a granular level about something, and doesn't really know how to to pull to to distinguish the super high level you know masterclass version from the from the 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 uh, the basic version and. And, you know, and to be able to sort of turn that into something that, that uh, a mass market can appreciate. So, you, so you're, uh, you're adding that storytelling nature into, right. into it. You're, you're kind of finding those threads and kind of opening loops and closing loops and, um, and, and making it a page turner, where otherwise right. it, would exactly just, it would be a pretty dry, a dry read of, of like a right. technical a journal. Book, yes. Yeah, it takes, it takes. <laughs> so, so this, I mean, it's, what I find fascinating is, is going back to, you know, your, your history of, of like almost becoming a teacher and, you know, you could argue, you know, with your work with like Saken, for example, 
you, you may have had more impact upon education and teaching by doing what you do now. Yes. And, and that, right, that, that you could have ever had as, a, as an individual teacher. I, I'm sure that's true. And I'm actually, thank you for saying that because I hadn't thought of that until you just said it. Uh, but yes, I think, uh, I think that probably is true. And I think, you know, that's, you know, the reality of, of the book business and, uh, you know, about, about the, the information business in, in general is that if you can find a way to, you know, to, to get your message out to a, a large number of, of people that there's, uh, there, there, there are a few ways to be more persuasive. So can you tell us about a time where you worked on a project, working on a book project, and you gave it your, your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason, it just really didn't work out. It didn't, it didn't turn out like you'd hoped. And more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from that experience? Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I mean, I guess, you know, there, there have been a few cases. I mean, there was, there was a situation. Well, I mean, there was, there was one situation that came up a few years ago where, um, where I was working with someone on a, on a nonfiction book that I thought was on, it was, the, well, I don't want to say what the book was about because it didn't turn out well, but it was, it, it, but um, it, it was a, it was a book that I, th- I thought had a great message, um, uh, you know, an important message, a soulful message. I thought that, um, that the, the, the person I was working with was, um, you know, had, had a, a way to present the material that, had never existed before. And I, and I, and I thought we, we did a really, really good job with the book. Um, as, as did the publisher thought we did a a great job with the book. Um, but it did not connect. I mean, and I thought, and I I thought it was, it was a a book that, that you could use and that, that, um, that consumers could really, um, could, could really get something out of instantly and that everybody could gain something from it. Um, and what that was, that was actually my first experience as a writer with coming up against what has now become a, a, a fairly pervasive piece of the business, which is um, that the, 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 the business has become bifurcated into a sort of you know, success or, or, or no success model hmm. based on, on – platform and publicity and, and that sort of thing that has less and less to do with the content than it ever did before. You know, back when, you know, when I was you know, on the corporate side of publishing, we certainly had books that failed. Um, and we certainly had good books that failed. But the, but at the failure, you know, but, but there were very few cases where a great book didn't sell at all. And, you know that there, you know, maybe it didn't sell. You know, maybe it didn't make money. Maybe it didn't justify the advance that we paid for it. Um, you know, maybe it wasn't a bestseller when we thought it was going to be a bestseller. But it didn't not sell at all. And now there are regularly very, very good books, sometimes even great books that don't sell at all because the because of an inability to um, to connect with whatever you know, media stream is, is necessary to connect with in order to, uh, you know, to, to make it happen. And in, in this case was, uh, was a situation where, you know, the author's platform was not great. The publisher couldn't build up the platform. Um, you know, the publicist we hired couldn't, couldn't do it. And, and so the book just, uh, just failed. But that, I mean, that must frustrate you as a, oh, as, as, as a, also as a, as a lover of, of books and also, um, I mean, in, in terms of the book, I come more from the music industry, but, you know, that classic thing of A&R, where it would take a number yes. of books, it takes a number of albums to someone, you know, to really find their voice and a style and, and connect with an audience. And you would just have to kind of, you would give them that time and everything. I would imagine now, um, and this is certainly from, I, I hear a lot around the, the non, more the non-fiction and information marketing, where the books are almost being written as, as a you know a low cost lead magnet low thing in order yes. to get people in so you can upsell them on your other products and other things in the back end which will make much more money but usually the publisher will never see you know or, uh, or the agent will never see anything out of so can you tell our listeners about uh, an insight or, or a light bulb moment a moment in your life where you had it was that kind of aha moment where you made a new distinction or a new discovery about about the business of of writing I think the the 
big aha moment for me when I realized that I needed to be a writer, even though uh, I wasn't sure how I was going to actually become one, was when I uh, I went out on tour with Ray Bradbury the first time he ever did a, a book tour. Um, Ray, you know, when I was publisher of Avon, we brought Ray over to uh, to our list, and and um, and he'd been publishing for a very long time at that point, but had been uh, until recently it had been afraid to fly, so he had never gone on a book tour, and so we were the first publisher to ever get to send him across the country. And one of the things that was just remarkable about the experience was not only that every place we went hundreds and sometimes thousands of people would show up at these at these signing events but that every single time at every single event there would be a point where somebody would come up with a book start to tell ray how much their his work meant to that person and burst into tears and then ray would start crying and then like the people on the staff would start crying because it was such a, a you know an, an emotionally you know charged moment and and i saw you know in in very clear fashion just how much books meant to people you know and and how completely a writer could affect a reader's life and i thought i have to have that you know (laughs) i've got i've got i've got to find you know i've got to find a way to to experience you know to have that experience because it is you know I i don't know how many other ways you can connect with the world where 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 you touch people at that at that level and you know i'm not suggesting that i will ever you know be ray bradbury because you know to me he's one of the great writers of of all time but 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 the fact that um that you know just watching it unfold and the fact that it just kept happening that it wasn't just this one case in chicago or something like that but that it was happening all over the country meant that you know that you know the people were just having this experience from connecting with this man's work um and you know that's you know that's remarkable um and you know to me that was you know that was what told me that you know i i could you know i, I could accomplish a lot of things as a publisher but i will never accomplish that as a publisher um if i'm going to if i'm going to ever get to that i'm going to have to do it as a writer so does, does that make you more likely to want to go out on book tours then because uh, because <laughs> i know a lot of a lot of authors really don't like doing the book tours no they're, they're terrible they're, sol- they're, terrible sol- they're solitary by by nature <clears throat> and uh, going out on the book tour and spending that that time doing uh, doing that thing is is so did you actually enjoy going out and doing the book tours when you need to do them no i hate it i hate it it's horrible <laughs> and, and no that that's not and i don't think if i if i ever have that moment it won't be that you know actually i you know i feel like the only the, you know the equivalent of that and again i am not putting myself in raised category in any way but you know i do get i, I my the, my favorite novel the novel that means the most to me of mine um is my novel blue and um and blue is is and one of the reasons it's it's a, a favorite of mine is that it's it, it, it an intensely emotionally charged um, novel and um, and I've gotten a lot of letters from readers um, telling me how the book affected them and that's you know certainly a a tiny fraction of of what uh, of the Ray Bradbury experience but it does actually sort of give me you know, an enormous level of satisfaction. I mean, I could get by, uh, you know, for days on, on one of those letters because, you know, to me, that's, uh, that means I've, I've really done my job, you know, much more than whether the book sold or not, which, you know, it sold fine, but, you know, but, you know, much more than whether the book sold is, is, you know, whether people actually felt the book or whether it was just, you know, a, a few hours entertainment for them. And, you know, certainly the latter is, is way more valuable to me. And I'm, I'm guessing as well, Unlike, let's say, even a star teacher that teaches or a great university professor or a, um, a great live performer, great music performer, those are only ever going to be experienced by the people of that when that, that artist is alive or that teacher is alive. But your work is going to be read. You know, I mean, I, yesterday I was reading um, a, a slightly unusual book, but it's uh, the his, second chapter of uh, Histories by Herodotus. And he was mm. t- talking, telling a story about the archer, um, why an archer takes off, unstrings their bow before they, uh, when they're not using it, because otherwise it would snap and break. And it was actually a bigger story about how when you relax, relax. You know, that, that was really the, mm, kind yeah. of what he was telling as part of it. And I'm thinking, you know, I wonder when he was writing that if he had any conception 
that that was going to be read um you know 2000 plus years <laughs> you yeah, know indeed, after his, after his death and some of these obviously these books you're and you would hope that and people like ray bradbury incredible right you you know fine well that those books are going to be read uh for many yes. many generations and it kind of goes, goes as, on. as long as we're reading i think yeah as long as we're reading so what, what's some of the best advice you know obviously you've been involved in the, 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 the business side as well as the writing side but when it comes to the writing side what's the, the some of the best advice that you've received about um not just making a living as a writer, but actually, you know, really striving to have to be a great writer. Um, you know, I think, I mean, the best the best advice I ever I ever got actually was again from Ray. Um, you know, where he just you know, he you know he he told me to care. You know, I mean, I think that that you know, and as simple as that sounds, um, I think it's it's very easy to forget. You know, that if you're if you're always writing about what matters to you in some way that you're likely to do a much, much better job of, of writing mm. um, and a much more authentic job of writing than if you're trying to, you know, if you're, if you're trying to, to, to describe emotions that you don't have or describe connections that, that you don't have. And, and, you know, one of the things that, it, it, and this switches over to the other side of the business, but it, it's analogous. Um, you know, w- one of the things that I always told my, my staffs when I was running a large editorial staff uh, was that the only thing that they had to do was strive to acquire books that they would actually pay for themselves. And, you know, if they if they ignored every other temptation, if they ignored the temptation to, to, you know, to go to acquire something because the market for that was hot at the moment, or, or acquire something because the numbers looked good, but rather just acquire something that you could absolutely guarantee me you would walk into the store and pay full price for this book. Um, you're re- you represent a significant enough piece of the market that there's a decent chance that we'll be successful with it. And I think for a writer, the same thing holds. If you can, if you can express the things that you're really connected to as honestly as you possibly can, there's a significant enough number of people on the other side of the, of the, of the book who are also experiencing those emotions that they'll connect with it. And then you have a decent chance of, of really finding a, 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 not only an audience in the moment, but a, but a long-term audience. And how careful are you when when you're working with these writers and, th- and just thinking in terms of longer term longer term with a, with a book to um, to try and uh, when you're describing things not getting too uh, uh, example with it's almost talking about promoting on uh, example like Facebook on social social media something that's very right. now um, do you have to really actively kind of work with them to try and tilt this in a slightly different way so they're, they're going at the bigger the bigger picture because i can imagine you know those some of those books can date pretty quickly and i, yes. I think even i think even like really good books like books i enjoy in that kind of non-fiction like the tim ferris type books and things mm-hmm. around that world um they, they they're, they're great they're really good books i really enjoy reading them but you can see that they're probably going to date relatively quickly and and that's a problem with non-fiction with fiction it's relatively easy because it's fairly easy to to pull away from, unless you're trying to evoke a moment, you know, and, and even with a contemporary novel, you could be writing that novel in such a way that you're trying to capture right now. So when people read it 20 years from now, they won't say it's dated. They'll say it's of its time, Mm. but, but with a nonfiction book, it's much, much harder and, and almost something that you can't avoid in a lot of cases because you, in order to make your argument, you need to use current information, and sometimes that requires you to uh, to pos- put you know to put yourself in the position where where you are going to be dated. I actually had a situation um, not not um, you know just a couple of months ago where a a, a publisher a, a foreign publisher was uh, was picking up a book that um, that you know we'd published I, you know a collaborator and I had had, uh, had published. You know, ten years ago, and was while put while doing the translation was doing some some fact checking and checking on our references and that sort of thing, and had some questions for me. And I realized, wow, there's a there's a lot, uh, there are several things in here that are out of date at this point that that aren't are either not relevant or 
the reference doesn't refer to anything anymore. It doesn't, re- you know, it doesn't refer to anything that would be uh, be meaningful to to the reader anymore. Uh, but in in all of those cases, I needed them at the time. You know, I needed mm-hmm. to make the reference at the time in order for the book to have presence in this. You know, in the in the market that we were going into, and that is a, an enormous issue for for many nonfiction books, uh, because you know, I'm, I mean, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, especially in the, in the business, you know, that that business part, entrepreneurship part, when absolutely things are coming and going, and uh, that's a bit more difficult. But funny enough, I was just I was um, I was speaking with a previous guest we had recently, Rolf Kent, who writes the music for Dexter and uh, loads of great. TV shows and movies, and mm. uh, he was talking about The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, yeah. and 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 I spoke to someone else the other day from uh, from one that in Silicon Valley who was also talking about that as well. And I guess there's a book of an example of it's a so book sorry. of its time, but it's not um, it's, it doesn't date, but it's of its time. If you know if you know what I mean. Oh yes, yes, it was, and and right. I'm not sure that The Artist's Way would be published like The Artist's Way now. You know, I don't think I think the book would be a very different book. But I think that um, the the moment when she wrote that book was very much a moment when we were opening ourselves up to other possibilities and, and to thinking in different ways and, and that sort of thing. And that um, and and that was very much of that time. But the message in that book doesn't change. And I think what you know, pe- you know readers for the most part are pretty bright, yeah. and they can adapt. You know, they can see. You know that okay, maybe this isn't as relevant now as it was in 1995, but but the message, the overall message, is very relevant, and, and that's what I'm picking up on. I'm guessing if if if, you, if someone like that wrote that type of book today, it would be around creativity hacking and neuro creativity. Exactly. <laughs> it'll, be, exactly. it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be in that world, but uh, yeah. So the, that, that, I'm sure those books are coming if they're not already on the shelves already. Um, do you have an online resource or tool or an app like Evernote that, that you love and you find really useful for yourself as a writer? You know, I really don't. I mean, I, I know that people. I I use Evernote, and I you know, and I uh, yeah, I sort of I sort of use it the way I would use like a piece of paper. So I'm probably not very bright at this, but uh, you know, I I just don't. You know, what I've never found, I've never found an app that I love as um, as a writer. I know that um, uh, you know that, that that writers have have used various organizing tools and that sort of thing, and and it just you know to me. There's something there's there's something about technology getting in the way that I don't particularly like. I mean, when I'm writing a novel, I I actually use an Excel spreadsheet to storyboard the novel. So um, so you know, it's not like I don't see the value of of having organizing tools, but I've never really found one that um, that I think does anything more for me than I can do for myself. And so, when you're writing, is are you using uh, like Scrivener or Final Draft, or using tools like that, or, or is it something like more like, like Word when you're actually writing? Really, I just use Word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, again, and there are a lot of writers who swear by Scrivener, and and you know, and like the fact that uh, it, that it 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 breaks the work into component forms and, and that sort of thing. I don't. I mean, I really feel like I, I guess because I do a huge amount of work before I get started. Uh, you know, by the time I by the time I start writing a novel, I've been working on it for six months in terms of developing the characters and developing the story and and moving story components around and that sort of thing. And that, uh, Speak- but are you developing that on? Is it you know like, like Excel. The press field? The, so Excel. Wow. I mean, I, I think you're probably the first writer I've ever spoken to that uses Excel. Ironically, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the char- I obviously don't do the character stuff on on Excel. I, I do the character stuff mostly in my head uh, yeah. by asking myself lots and lots of questions about the characters. But in terms of of storyboarding, what I've actually found is that Excel is really effective because of how easy it is to move things back and forth, um, and to you know just sort of sort and and that sort of thing in ways that make it very easy to see how multiple storylines are working together and and that kind of thing um and i know that you can do that in in scrivener for instance but i've already got it mastered in excel so well, i'm they, not changing they, uh, uh, one of one of our listeners um uh, recently contacted me he works at ibm and he works on all these in artificial intelligence projects and he uses some of the mm. creativity stuff that i teach and i'm sure someone like that will be very interested at, so, at some point if you're ever looking to 
have other people access that data to what makes a successful book and they can crunch all the Excel right. <laughs> data and things like that. that, 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 that is, that's a piece of work for someone. So finally, just we start to finish up here as well. If you could recommend just one record, one album and one book to our listeners, what would they be? Wow. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Well, the album, to me, the album will probably be Born to Run by Bruce Springsteen because of of, of of how much every song contributed to the overall effect of the album um, you know every every song to me every every song is a movement within a a much larger you know, piece that that he was creating in in that album and i also just think song by song it's you know it's it's among the best and records I, I, ever I made believe, i believe you worked with him as well did you know there was not some yeah, connection that's there, there is, but it's a, it's, it's a tangential connection at best. I, I, I published, yes, I published Bruce's first book. Bruce's uh, uh, autobiography is coming out uh, very soon, but, but I published um, Bruce's book of lyrics where he, uh, he annotated the, uh, the, the lyrics for us, and, and that was tremendous. But, uh, but to say I worked with him, well, Bruce Springsteen does all of his own work, and, and, and he, d- he delivers what he delivers, and, and everybody um, just – says wow another work of genius great <laughs> um but um but the uh, but that you know to me that album is, is you know you know it, 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 i would either say that or or pet sounds which is the you know to me uh, brian wilson is a is a personal hero of of mine um at least as a as a creative artist and um and to uh, me again i think the cohesive nature of that album is just remarkable and then what would the book be what's that uh, which is i'm sure is extremely difficult Wow, uh, question it is, to answer, it is, or is there is, is there one book that you've gifted maybe more often? I know it's a difficult question to ask any author what your favorite book, but is there maybe a book that you've gifted more often? Sometimes that's a it's a little bit easier than what your I guess. Yeah, book. I guess the the book I've turned people on to more than than any other book is um, is The Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy, mm. um, because to me it sort of defined you know great commercial writing. You know that there was that he was he he took commercial fiction to an art form with that with that novel and to me I think that's that's you know the the ideal way to communicate because because you're reaching a large audience but you're reaching them with powerful messages and great craft and you know and when you bring all of that together you know it it doesn't happen all that often but when you do bring it all together it's uh, it's extraordinary. Great. And so we'll put all these links to the show notes. People just type in jamestaylor.me, go to that site and type in Lou Ironica. You're going to get all the show notes here as well. So final question for you, Lou. Imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have all the tools of your trade and the knowledge that you've acquired over the years, but no one knows you. You have no contact. You have to start again. How would you restart? Huh. Um, I think I would just I, I would just try to find the thing in me that that felt that the, the felt the, the biggest need to come out that felt like the most the truest thing the, the the most honest thing that needed to come out and then just try to find the most effective way to express that um, and try as hard as I possibly could to ignore the business until the work was was finished <laughs> because it, you know I think the the biggest problem for new writers and actually I'm going to be talking about this at a conference this weekend weekend in fact um, the biggest problem for writers I think right now is that they're trying to think about the marketplace and their work at the same time and they're then they're two different things yeah well it's been a pleasure having you on the show today, Lou. Thank you so much for coming on. What's Thank the you. best way for listeners to connect with you to learn more about your yeah, your books and the projects you're working on? Um, they can either go to luaronica.com or um, they can, for the, on the publishing side, they can go to thestoryplant.com to see what we're publishing next. Well, I wish you all the best with the new book. And uh, you've, got, you've got the book with uh, Ken Robinson, I'm sure. And your Working next away on uh, it right now. novel. <laughs> yeah, marvelous. I'm looking forward to reading it when it comes out. Thanks for coming on the show, Lou. Thank you. Take care. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.